Our next speaker is uh, my longtime colleague in this uh, in this effort, Mr. Joel Gardner. He has written a number of of opinion pieces, papers, um, articles, and the like. Uh, has met uh, with Jim Ryan many times uh, and has spoken about you know the lack of intellectual diversity on the grounds of the university. And I'm going to give him the podium right now you know, to talk about it further. There is one thing that, uh, that, that has happened I will bring to your attention, another positive following up on Connor. There is, a, there is a movie that was made by a number of UVA students last year um, called Common Ground. Uh, you can get a, it's about a 29 minute movie. I would urge you to read, you know, to, to watch that. You can get it off the website of the Senator, Center for Politics from Larry Sabato, he executive produced it. And it's a whole, a whole lot of students talking about issues from different points of view, like I think should happen on a, on a university campus, um, and, and coming to a friendly, con you know, not conclusions, but that friendly debate, and how to keep on doing it. It's worth, well worth watching, make you feel better. But now, Joe, where are you? Where are you? Come on up and thank the buddy. Thanks, Bert. Bert, uh, you know, I have been friends uh, for about 50 years. Um, and I think we have reunited recently uh, on common ground. Uh, I had the beard first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just let me introduce myself. My name is Joel Gardner. I graduated from the college in 1970. I was an active uh, student leader as an undergraduate, uh, involved in student government, writing for the Cavalier Daily with the IFC. I returned to law school after active service in the Army, uh, where I was a member of student council with Larry Sabato, so I've known Larry for 50 years as well. Um, after graduating from law school, I went back to New York but really never left the university and never left Charlottesville in my heart. I've served on four different university boards. I've chaired or co-chaired over a half a dozen fundraising campaigns. I'm a two-time uh, UVA parent. And in uh, 2014, I, after I quit my day job and convinced my wife to leave New York to move down to Charlottesville, I became a Charlottesville resident joined the board, my wife joined the board, and uh, that did not end well. In any way, I moved back to New York because just couldn't take what was going on at the university and in Charlottesville. So why am I here? I'm here because UVA is part and parcel of who I am. I unabashedly say I love this university. I love our founder, Mr. Jefferson. And I love my best friends, most of whom I met here on grounds. And why are we here? We're here because this is a call to action. The heart and soul of our university is being gutted on a continuing basis. The values we hold dear and centuries of the University of Virginia students and faculty members have held dear, had been eviscerated by two successive administrations at this university. What are these values? Individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of association, diversity of thought, Mr. Jefferson, the honor system, civility, camaraderie, all of them are under attack, have been under attack, and are currently under attack at this university, notwithstanding the fine words we hear on a regular basis emanating from Madison Hall. So this is a call to action. And I'm going to speak most, I can speak for quite a while. I mean, Bert's keeping me on time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, I got involved when I, uh, with 
my writing about what was going on here after moving to Charlottesville in 2014. I'd seen, even before then, uh, pretty closely, I'd been watching the university. I like to say I was probably the only investment banker on Wall Street who read the Cavalier Daily online before reading the Wall Street Journal. Uh, when I came here through various organizations I belonged to, I was in constant uh, contact with students, faculty members, and administrators. And as each year passed, I became more aware of discontent and them saying, hey, we're afraid to speak up. We're being indoctrinated. We're being intimidated. And I heard it more and more. And I started having conversations with members of the administration. But they really never went far. I always felt that I was sort of doing this myself. But I think as Bert said earlier on, the um, FU sign on the lawn brought a lot of us together. And we really started acting in a united fashion. I started writing some articles. I wrote an open letter to Jim Ryan that got out and was made public. Um, I wrote an article about the dangers of the politicization of UVA, which was published by the James Martin Center down in North Carolina. And the resulting was a number of conversations with Jim Ryan, where I was pushing for the university to adopt a statement of free speech principles. Uh, Jim, in one of the early conversations, said to me, but you know, Joel, that most universities who adopt these is merely virtue signaling. They adopt them and nothing happens. They said, sure, Jim, I understand that. I don't care how eloquent the words are and how nicely framed they are. Unless they're administrator, they administered appropriately, they're not going to mean anything. Well, shortly thereafter, uh, in his wisdom, um, the president decided to create a committee on free inquiry uh, and free speech. And I was honored to be asked to be a member. There were 12 people on the committee. Uh, not a very balanced committee. I would say 10 were left of center and two were probably somewhat right of center. But that didn't bother me. I've been used to being speaking up. Uh, like when I was on student council and uh, in law school, along with Tom Sansonetti, a number of, member of our board who's out in Wyoming. Uh, it's okay to do that, as long as you're able and willing to stand up and make, have your voice be heard, do it intelligently and civilly. Uh, I could speak for an hour on what went on during this committee. But early on, uh, remember the talk I had with Jim at the very initial uh, Zoom meeting we had at the committee, I said, OK, we're going to adopt these principles. And is our committee going to be involved with administering them? The answer was very quick and very rapid, absolutely not. We create the principles. The administration will administer them. OK, we move on. There's a discussion. Uh, a number of us pushed for opening up during the committee to have both oral and written statements made to the committee. Well. There was one call-in, uh, kind of uh, community call-in, which was amazing because I think it was the first six call-in by faculty members of the university who all talked about institutional indoctrination, institutional intimidation, uh, literally being told what language to use in class, mandated training, which was ideologically centered. This went on and on. And, and the last speaker, I believe, was uh, Ken Elzinger, um, who I was proud to say sat in the very first course class he taught in the fall of 1967 in Old Cabell Hall. Uh, and Ken summed up uh, his call by saying, what is going on at UVA today is a tragedy. Think about that for a second. The professor at UVA, probably the most revered living professor, who's taught more students than any other professor in the history of our university, said what is going on today at UVA is a tragedy. Well, 
not sure the impression all that made. Uh, we received written uh, submissions. Uh, there was a tenured professor who was so afraid of uh, being attacked socially and professionally that uh, she would only speak through me. I had I made that submission on that professor's behalf to the Board of Visitors. So while this is all going on, uh, we learned a couple of things. I'm just going to take two as an example of what we learned. And part of it uh, was, well, I found both of these things astonishing. One is the Bhattacharya medical student lawsuit against UVA. Not sure how many of you are aware of it, but I'll try to sum it up quickly. A medical student uh, attended a mandated uh, session on microaggressions. As we all know, a fraught subject to be sure. Uh, after the uh, session was over, they opened up for a question and answer period. And Mr. Bhattacharya uh, asked a number of persistent and direct questions and continued to follow, ask follow-up questions after he received what he considered un unsatisfactory responses, but was only civil. You can go online and you can actually hear the question and answer. It is online. After that was over, he was secretly sanctioned by a, by a professional card uh, that was put into his file and then called to what could only be called a Kafka S Star Chamber proceeding, where he kept on asking, Why am I here? and they wouldn't tell him specifically. Make a long story short, he was eventually dismissed from the university, destroyed the student's career as a future doctor. Now, the university takes the position that he was dismissed for other reasons, yet his personal issues, blah, blah, blah. But this was the fruit of the poison tree, the poison tree being that he was sanctioned for his free speech. He sued the university, and this is where it, it, it becomes incredible. At the same time that the university was taking the position that the student on the lawn could say F you on the only, and put it up on the door of the only UNESCO World Heritage, academic UNESCO World Heritage site in North America, they took the university, our university, took the position in the brief submitted to the court that what Mr. Bhattacharya stated in his questions was not protected by the First Amendment. Astonishing. He was questioning a fraught subject, an academic subject. He was civil. He was persistent, but he was civil. And the university took the position that he could not do that. It was not protected speech. Incredible, Inc absolutely amazing, a disgrace to this institution. And by the way, the, 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 this case is still in court, but the university moved to dismiss the case, and the court struck down their argument on the First Amendment, basically saying, of course, that speech is protected. It wasn't even close. But remember, this is going on at the same time. Two different students treated two different ways. The other thing we learned during this period was that in a number of schools of the university, they were issuing, um, looking for new faculty members, and in order to file, and when you had to file your application, as part of an application, and there's a number of schools, the Baton School was one, uh, Darden was another, the New Data Sciences School was another. The applicant had to pledge, in essence, pledge allegiance to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And here, I learned that during that period, not that I had suspected beforehand, that the root of most of the issues we have on freedom of speech, freedom of expression, intimidation, indoctrination, is the, this university institutionally and systemically 
adopting a social and political agenda and forcing it down the throats of every member of the university community. It has become a quasi-religion that has crept into every crevice of life here at the university. And make no mistake, it is I call the so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion because none of that is what it appears. It is not about diversity. There is an academic principle that most schools should adopt about diversity of thought and diversity of opinions in university, but that's not what it means. They base diversity only on diversity of race, ethnicity, and gender. Equity, is that fairness? It has nothing to do with fairness. It has nothing to do with equal opportunity, which is what this country hopefully was built upon, and which allowed myself, who's the son of an immigrant who came to this country in steerage and grew up in extreme poverty, to be where I am today. It's not about equity or equal opportunity. It's about equal results based on race, gender, and ethnicity. And inclusion, any of us here that know and love this university know that today on grounds, this is the most divided community we have ever had. Camaraderie, collegiality, things that were so important, they take second position to the agenda. And make no mistake, this is DEI as applied at UVA is not an academic ideal, it is a political agenda. And I'd love to quote uh, Dean Anthony Cryman, who, is, who was the former dean of Yale Law School, who's written a book and articles called The Downside of Diversity, where he says, diversity as applied at universities today is not an academic value. Its origin and aspiration are political. It, and this is key, it's a great sentence. It is a political campaign masquerading as an educational ideal. And that's exactly what it is. And because that we have an institutionally mandated political agenda going on, it by nature causes freedom of speech to be frozen. Who wants a university takes a position, what faculty member, what student, what parent is going to stand up and oppose that for fear of retribution. Um, a long time ago, prior at the University of Chicago, prior to the Chicago principles, which were only formulated and uh, distributed about a decade ago, there was a uh, committee of faculty called the Calvin Committee. Um, and the Calvin Committee issued a statement back during the Vietnam War. And it went straight to the heart of this matter. Um, the Calvin Committee, it, it, it's only about two pages, and I really, really would advocate for all of you and suggest all of you read that said that the mission of the university is the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. The university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself a critic. The university thus cannot take collective action on the issues of the day without endangering the conditions for its existence and effectiveness. There is no mechanism by which it can reach a collective position without inhibiting the full freedom of dissent on which it thrives. It cannot insist that all its members favor a given view of social policy. The Calvin Committee statement for years and decades was followed by most universities. It is not the case now, not only at UVA, it's throughout the country. But remember, we are a public university. This is not a private university which may argue for being able to take a position. We are a public university that should not be acting as an advocate for a political agenda. 
So sitting on the committee, I decided to paraphrase the uh, Calvin Committee report. And there is, I got one, I only have two slides, I think there's one slide, which is the paragraph I submitted to the committee. Yes. So this was the paragraph I submitted to my committee. Straightforward, non-political, rational, reasonable, support of what a university should be. And what was the response? The response was, I was told by the committee chair that this was not part of our mandate. <laughs> that raising the issue as to whether a university should take an institutional position on political and or social issues was a different subject for a different time. And my response was, of course it's part of our mandate. We have a, we're supposed to be preparing principles of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. This goes to the heart of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Yet, it was tabled, refused, the chair refused to even bring it for a vote. So, result, I'll just give you another little anecdote, the day that we were gonna vote on the principles, which by the way were beautifully crafted, very reasonable, didn't have what I consider to be the heart and soul of it. Um, Liz McGill calls me, lobbying me to support it. They really wanted to have a, uh, a unanimous vote on this. There's a lot of stories behind this I can tell you, but this is one I will. Um, so I said, Liz, yeah, I like the language, but you know, they shot down that part of, the, of what I was proposing about not being able to take political and social uh, stands institutionally. And she said, well, you know, Joel, she said, you know, I think that universities should be able to take positions on issues that affect students' lives. And I thought for a second, I said, Liz, what issues don't affect students' lives as members of our community? I said, are you ready for the university to take a position on abortion? And silence, no response. They, there is an amount of hypocrisy and disingenuous, disingenuousness that flows from our administration, which is staggering. Well, we passed it, it was unanimous hour. This is a great story, exactly. We unanimously passed it. We have our principles of freedom of expression, and I waited a while. And I wanted to see whether it would be administered. And I'll just bring two examples, which led me to write another uh, article which was published by the James Martin Center a month ago called UVA and the New McCarthyism. Um, one had to do with critical race theory being mandated at Alderman Library. And, I mean, my friend Jim Bacon, member of our council, was out there, he broke this story. I mean, you know, we have a, our new administration in Richmond, thank the Lord, um, has said that CRT should not be taught at in K through 12, I think, of course, shouldn't be taught at any state university. But I just picked examples of three statements that were part of the mandated CRT training going on at Alderman Library. I mean, that's amazing. That's critical race theory, bold and strong, no doubt about it. And uh, Jim's story was about uh, a um, employee who resigned rather than have to be subjected to this. So I came down to Charlottesville shortly after this was made public. I went to see Jim Ryan and I said, Jim, you know, this is wrong. You know, what are you going to do about it? The answer was basically nothing. Um, 
I also raised the issue uh, Connor uh, alluded to before, which is uh, not only now do you have to pledge allegiance uh, to DEI to be hired as an active faculty member, you have to pledge allegiance to DEI. It came out during the peer review process from the college. Our new provost, who then was the uh, dean of the college, approved this. So every member of the college faculty have to say how they have in the past and will in the future support DEI. I mean, have you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have, after this became apparent, CR, you know, the critical race theory training mandated. I had conversations with a couple of senior members of our administration. And a number of them had the same response. And again, this is absolutely frightening and staggering. The response to my saying that there are groups of students based on organizations they belong to based on how they feel, and members of faculty too, who are being marginalized at this university today. And the response I got, at least twice, two different people, was that, you know, Joe, that's the way it's always been. He said, in the past, when you were a student, groups were marginalized on the basis of race and gender and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Today, it's just a different group being marginalized. I was stunned. I was listening to the top administrators at the University of Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, telling me that it was, in essence, OK that certain groups have been marginalized today. You know, I could only think of the biblical invocation that the sins of the parents should not be put on the heads of their children. Guess they didn't believe in that either. But this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an administration that says the right words. If you want to read the recent columns by Jim Ryan and Ian Balcom, they say the right things about freedom of speech and freedom of expression. <coughs> they talk about bringing speakers in whatever, but what they don't and what they will not address is what is at the essence of the danger to freedom of speech that exists, at, not only at UVA, but certainly, I don't care about the rest of them. I do care about my beloved university. It exists today at UVA. And I'll just end by uh, just telling a little anecdote. Why are we here? Call to action? Um, probably the most uh, outstanding or memorable event of my undergraduate career occurred during May Day's week in the spring of 1970 during the anti-war demonstrations. Um, one of my classmates sitting at the table right in front of me knows it well, Mark Krebs, who actually was in my dorm first year. Um, there were a number of demonstrations, some very raucous going on, but just in one of those slips of faith, um, Bill Kunstler and Jerry Rubin, two of the members of the Chicago Senate, had been invited to speak at UVA months before. And they spoke the week that uh, after the Kent State killings became known, and everybody was going crazy. So they spoke at U Hall. And U Hall was packed. I went to hear him speak. And Kunstler and Ruben whipped the crowd into a frenzy. And at the end of their speech, someone screamed, onto Cars Hill. And another screamed, burn it down. Well, people started leaving. There were no police whatsoever present. Uh, there were some graduate student marshals, one of them knew me came up to me and said, Joel, 
you come up to Cars Hill with me, I think there's going to be some real trouble. So we both sprinted up there. Uh, I was in a lot better shape back then. Uh, we got to Cars Hill, and there were about maybe 30 of us. Fortunately, a number of them were football players. I think we're probably football. There were some big people there. So we sat up, we stood out, out in front of Cars Hill, and we looked down, and we could see coming from U Hall, the uh, leaves on the trees hadn't really gone. You could see through that torchlight march, hundreds and hundreds of people snaking up towards Cars Hill. And they got up there, and there they started coming up the steps. And there's Bill Kunstler with a bullhorn continuing to stir the pot. And they come up, and as they're coming up to us, someone looked in the center and said, let's lock arms and form a chain. And that's what we did. So the 30 some odd of us, 30 some odd of us locked arms, stood in front of Cars Hill, and basically wouldn't let him pass, although we were facing probably up to 1,000 students. I think a number of them realized that it was not going to be very good to start real violence here. So they turned away. They went down to the Navy ROTC building where they did try to set it on fire. So I'm just telling you that story because what I'm asking everybody here today is to figuratively lock arms to preserve and protect our university. It is under attack. And now we're in a situation where I actually think we can get something done. And I'll borrow the phrase from someone you know. Now here's the thing. The thing is that there is a new sheriff in town in Richmond. I think they are sympathetic to the issues we are raising. So I'm asking for all of you here to stand up Make your voices heard, because it's only by making our voices heard that we're all sitting here today. Make your voices heard. I think we have a sympathetic audience. I think our group is on a roll. I think we've, this group, and I thank so much my fellow colleagues on the board of the Jefferson Council, every one of which has contributed so much to our success, that we can make a difference. We can have change. We can demand that there be true freedom of expression. We can demand that there be real diversity of thought at this university, which, by the way, this administration pays lip service to and does it absolutely nothing about. We can demand that we return to a university where the grounds are characterized by civility and camaraderie. And we can demand that both the, the Board of Visitors and the President, both of whom are mandated to protect the honor system, do their job. It may be too late for this generation, but it's not too late for the following generations. The honor system is a blessing that every one of us who is a student here at the university took away with them for the rest of their lives. And it's something that this generation will miss, and hopefully it's something that can be reinvigorated and that we will be able to have future generations of Wahoos be able to make that part of who they are as well. So let's join our group, join what the Jefferson Council is doing, and let's make UVA great again. <laughs> Thank you.